Welcome to the fight with Teddy Atlas, presented by Dynamic Striking. I'm Ken Rideout, joined by announcer of the year, the great Teddy Atlas, announcer and podcaster of the year. Every year for me, the great Teddy Atlas. How you doing, Teddy? Happy New Year. I'm doing good. Happy New Year to you, to Rob, to my tweet team of uh, Ian Mackey, uh, of course, Rob Moore, our producer and friend, uh, Brendan Wood, everybody, and all the people out there, all our fans, all our listeners, and of course, to the man here with me who is uh, always filming away, Sam Rivera, and his everybody's families, everyone's families. Again, all of our listeners out there, I hope you guys had a great New Year. Um, I hope you had a a great celebration, a healthy one, uh, a happy one, uh, a safe one, and I hope that your year goes the same direction. Healthy, happy, prosperous, 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 prosperous. I'm gonna, I'm gonna get better. That's my, that that's my what do you call it for the new year resolution. resolution. Yeah, my resolution is to uh, pronounce my words better. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to work at that. I'm going to get better at that. But then some people are going to say, Teddy, don't do that. That's not, then that might not be you, um, the authentic you. But um, just I just hope we have a better year in general for everybody out there. More love, less hate. Um, just that's, that's always a good direction. More love, less hate, less problems. Uh, you know, I, I want everybody to to just come together as one as one country, as one country, and um, care about each other in a way that you know that we should. Uh, that you know we should find ways to to try to figure out how to look past certain things and to appreciate certain things that we don't appreciate enough. You know, to maybe overlook, because we all have faults, overlook some of the faults the best that we can, and appreciate some of the things that sometimes we don't take the time to really appreciate, you know, enough, you know, and maybe some of the things that are right around us. So anyway, talking about Man of the Year, Tom Brady, your man or your former man, he he had another late comeback to get the win and into the playoffs for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Uh, you know, I know that makes you happy um, to see to see Mr. Brady once again show his magic, which is just incredible. The other thing I want to mention is Ken, did you did you see the incredible games on New Year's Eve, Georgia and Ohio State, you know, and TCU in Michigan? Two games that were just, they were like fights. They were like Mickey Ward, uh, Arturo Gatti fights, back and forth. Um, uh, it was it was really, it, I'm going to pick a heavyweight title fight that was like, it was like Larry Holmes and, and uh, Larry Holmes and, and Ken Norton, a lot of people don't remember that fight. That was a great fight. That 15th round, when 15 round, that 15th round changed the course of two men's lives where Holmes went on to be, uh, you know, multi, 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 multi millionaire, great heavyweight champ. And Ken Norton was kind of almost a footnote as the guy who broke Ali's jaw. You know, he fought Ali three times. He beat him once broke his jaw, and some people thought he beat him at least twice. And he he was forgotten about to a certain extent, quite frankly. And, of course, didn't have the career that Larry Holmes had. And that fight was the kind of fight where you could have almost tossed a coin, where the last round really decided, you know, not only the fight, but, as I said, the future of two men. And um, so... That, that's what these two games were like. And the games, of course, were to decide who would go and play next week, next Monday, for the national championship in college football. And it's going to wind up being TCU in Georgia. And I want to say this. The, quarterback, the quarterbacks for Georgia and Ohio State, they were phenomenal. They were phenomenal. Matter of fact, the, the Ohio State quarterback m- might have, solidified himself as the number one pick in the draft that'll be coming up next year because he was unbelievable. And and my son likes him a lot. And of course, my son knows more football than all of us put together. But George, the quarterback, 
what a steady guy. What I mean, he is the epitome of when they talk about, and I talk about not having the glamorous talents, the neon talents, you know, but the other talents that are so important, like dependability, consistency, you know, steadiness. I mean, but both of them were, they were, it was just an incredible game between those game teams. TCU, Michigan, incredible comeback by Michigan. Um, Michigan, I felt terrible for them because they had a touchdown taken away by the ref. You hate to see the ref involved in a game like this, but they had a touchdown where it looked like he scored. And then they said, no, they put him down on a one foot line. And then the next play, what happens? They fumble the ball and TCU recovers. So they never get that touchdown back and they wind up losing, you know, and, and by that score. So uh, I think it was by that score, whatever it was, it was, it was, right down to the end and getting back to Georgia and Ohio State Georgia the defending champion Ohio State uh big underdog both teams were underdogs that won TCU and Ohio State but Ohio State again the underdog we love underdogs here Ken you know they they I mean it was just you talk about sad and and you feel bad for them I mean you it's it's again it's like the fight that you almost feel like nobody lost, you know, uh, nobody lost. It should have been a draw, but of course somebody loses. And that's what this game was like. And to make it even more remarkable was that I didn't watch the ball drop, okay? Full disclosure. I think you guys are starting to get the idea. I didn't see the ball drop. Every year I see the ball drop, you know, uh, with my family. And I didn't see it drop because I was watching this game and – Georgia, <laughs> and it was more exciting than watching a ball drop because I've seen that before. And Georgia and Ohio State, it comes down to a field goal try. And I don't think the coach did, the coach for Ohio State did any favor for the poor kicker from Ohio State because he got too conservative at the end. They marched all the way down the field to, to get a chance to, you know, to win the game with the comeback and win the game with the field goal. They were down by one point. They would have won by two. And he gets conservative. And then instead of being a shorter field goal or maybe a touchdown, it becomes a 50 yard. No gimme. No gimme. And the poor guy shanks it. Oh my God. He shanks it. Oh. Uh, uh, but here's the remarkable, even re more remarkable thing about it. As the kick goes up, it's exactly at the strike of midnight when the ball's falling. Exact as it goes through the the as it goes through the bars, it, it hits midnight. So it was like saying Happy New Year to Georgia, who wins right there. Happy New Year, Georgia, and better luck next year for Ohio State. It was a devastating for this poor kid, Ken, and I'm sure a lot of our fans watched it. And they were thinking the same thing. And then get back to the Michigan TCU game. I again, well, no, actually, the Ohio State Georgia game. The one last thing I want to say about that is that I think that coaching might have won the game, where the Georgia coaching was a little better. Where, like I said, Ohio State coach, terrific coach, but he gets too conservative at the end. Winds up with a 50-yard field goal because he's too conservative. After they weren't conservative, getting down there. That's how they got down there for that shot. And then all of a sudden, you know, it's like a fighter goes into the prevent defense. And now the guy couldn't get near him. Now the guy's walking right in and, and throwing bombs at him. He's got a chance to catch up so or catch him. So the, the play of the game. With all the great plays, and there was one great play after another in that Georgia Ohio State game. One after another, Ken. For me, the play of the game was when the Georgia coach caught a timeout late in the game when he noticed, when he saw an alignment at the last second. What a sharp guy. Coaching matters, where all of a sudden he saw an alignment, a setup just before they snapped the ball where Ohio State was punting and they were going to fake the punt. They were going to take a big gamble and they were going to fake the punt. And guess what? He caught a timeout. Nobody heard it except the ref. But nobody heard it in the field. So the play goes off 
and Ohio State gets the first down. It worked. It worked perfect, except the play don't count now. It comes back because there was a timeout called by the Georgia coach. That saved the game for Georgia. So I just wanted to I want to get all of that out there. Um, I'm ready to go with you, kid. I want to hear, though, before we do go, what you thought of those games, too. Yeah, they were unbelievable. Um, I was going to say the same thing about the Georgia coach. He deserves, he deserves a ton of credit for saving the day there because that would have changed the um, trajectory of that game for sure if Ohio State, Ohio State keeps the ball there. But I'm looking forward to the title game, um, TCU and Georgia. I would have said, you know, prior to seeing what TCU did, did against Michigan, I would have said Georgia beats them by 40 but now seeing what TCU did against Michigan, my God, when they're on, they're on fire. Man, they're, all of those games were incredibly ex- explosive offenses. Well, they're the, they're the Cinderella team, Ken. They're, For you sure. know, you're, Everyone loves the Cinderella story, right? And they're, especially if you have grandchildren, uh, they're the Cinderella team. So it should be a hell of a game. Oh, boy. I don't know how it could top those two games. Do you, I mean, really. They, they were yeah. there. And and how about your boy uh, Brady? You know, I don't know if you talked to him lately. I know you. I know you got rid of his number after he left. <laughs> after he left New England, I know you took him out of your Rolodex. But He's I don't know in. if things been patched up. Yeah, yeah. He's yeah, back I figure in those. After I figure those come. I figure <laughs> those comebacks might might somehow you know patch things up a little bit. Yeah, a little My bit. God, I'll tell you what. When people look back at the Brady Belichick years, I think that the, uh, the the narrative, if it was ever in favor of Belichick, has to shift to like more Brady than Belichick because forty five years Patri- old, Ken. Forty five years old do not look good. I mean, at times they're so bad it's embarrassing. I mean, some of the things that they're doing out there, like we talked about before, the game against they the pulled Raiders, off a big know. game. They pulled off. Oh yeah, it was unbelievable how they did that. That's but they they pulled off a win yesterday. So are they are they in the mix for one of these wild cuts? I know there's so they many. Gotta beat, they got to beat. They got to beat Buffalo in Buffalo next week. Buffalo's got a big game tonight against Cincinnati. This might be the game of the year, regular season. I think this game tonight will determine home field advantage. For all two the great quarterbacks. The two great. Talking about quarterbacks, wow! And Probably and the, the quarterback best. for Cincinnati, and the quarterback for Cincinnati, he's so hot right now. He's so yep. hot. This is going to be. I think this Ball, is like the best game of the year this uh, thus far. But yeah, the Patriots beat Miami at home. Like, oh, big freaking deal! They the, Miami didn't even have this starting quarterback in, and we still almost lost. Oh, even if they get to the playoffs, they'll be a twenty point underdog in the first game. Um. Yeah, I'm sorry to bring up these things to you. That's Ken. all right. The Patriots, I, I uh, the, the Celtics, and the Bruins are both miles ahead of everyone else in the league. So we're pro- we're bound to get Good one come back. Two titles Touché. this year. Touche, there, my man. <laughs> Touche, my man. Celtics look awesome. Uh, Bruins do too. Bruins. Both of those teams look great. But let's talk fighting. Let's jump right in, Teddy. We're going to do a year-end recap, talk about fight of the year, fighter of the year, knockout of the year, et cetera, et cetera. We've got a ton of stuff to cover. Let's jump right in and start with fight of the year, Teddy. There was some good ones last year. Let's get into it. Who'd you like for fight of the year? My man. Okay. Well, fight of the year. You got a, you got a couple, but... I, I think Lee Wood, the TKO of Michael Conlon in the twelfth round for the featherweight title, I, I that's got to be that's got to be mine. Um, that was mine as well. Yeah, there's a few of them, Ken. But I mix in a couple of things when I come up with it because it's not easy. You got to mix. A, the atmosphere was incredible over in England. the The atmosphere, the the crowd, not just for Conlon, for both men. And the back and forth nonstop action, you know, uh, with that great atmosphere. Conlon scores a knockdown in the closing seconds of the opening round. Looks like it's going to be an easy night for him. Teddy, it looked he, like the ref was going to stop it. He had him hurt so badly. It wasn't just a, fla- a flash knockdown. He was cracked. His leg bent underneath him. He was hurt badly. Yeah, he gets saved by the bow. And then yep. the second round, he's still, as you, to your point, he's still hurt. And um, what, what that is. And Conlon tries to finish him. And then Conlon gets cut. And again, the supporters there, both sides going crazy. Um, 
Wood went to the body. Uh, Wood they just he comes back. He's a gritty guy. Back and forth. He's physically stronger than Conlon. Back and forth. All the whole fight. Uh, it gets to late in the fight. Wood's going to the body a little bit more. Round eleven seconds before the bell. Again, talking about seconds before the bell. Again, we revisit that kind of scenario. Um, to end the eleventh, Wood dropped. Drops Conlon. He turns around. He drops Conlon with a left hook. And Conlon gets right up. You know, he, he's not as hurt as Wood was early in a fight. He gets right up. But, the, you know, the, the tide had shifted. The tide had shifted a little bit. Uh, Conlon, here's what also makes it so dramatic and, and makes it my fight of the year. The action, the crowd, and also the theater. The theater of it. Conlon was ahead going into the 12th round, 104 to 103, 105 to 102, and 104, 103. <coughs> so, all three scorecards, he's ahead. Woods needs to win the round to get a draw, to retain his, I think it was WBA regular title. Regular title, what, the, what is that? Regular, extra large, large, extra, uh, vente, uh, uh, go to Starbucks, you, uh, you get a vente, you get a, anyway, 12th round, Wood jumps on Conlon, backs him into the ropes, Ken, uh, <laughs> and then he knocks, he knocks Wood knocks Conlon stiff, like the old times would say. I mean, literally stiffens him against the rope. I mean, he makes him look like a piece of wood. And and Conlon dangerously and dramatically falls through the ropes out of the ring. Um, devastating, just devastating. Knockout, incredible fight. Uh, if I had a runner-up, Ken... I might, I might throw in uh, Jamel Charlo when he knocked out uh, Brian Castano in ten rounds. That was a pretty damn good fight. And again, you had a big underdog, you know, trying to pull off an upset against Charlo. Uh, the Charlo brothers—they don't get put in the deepest waters, uh, quite frankly. You know, uh, they get taken pretty good care of by Al Heyman over there. Um, but hey, listen. Uh, they they get the job done for the most part, and uh, you know I figure let me let me shout out one of them. I don't I don't do that probably enough. Sometimes some people might say so. I'll throw him in there as a runner up. But I think that I think that Wood and Conlon really that was that that's set to stand it uh, for for fight of the year. I throw an honorable mention for uh, Katie Taylor and Amanda Serrano. That was a hell of a fight. I was at yeah. that fight. Man, yeah, that no, was no. exciting. That would be right up there. Matter of fact, you stole my thunder, but that's all right. That's all right. You, because I was going to say we're concentrating really on these awards in the men's category. We're not being chauvinistic, mm. but we are. We, we're, yep. we're concentrating on that. But you're 100% right. I made a note of it. That Katie Taylor and and Amanda um, Serrano for that fight at Madison Square Garden. You talk about theater. You had a packed garden. You 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 actually set history by being the first female main event at the illustrious Madison Square Garden, where so many great fighters, so many great fights have taken place, you know, over the years. You had the fight of the century there with Ali and Frazier. I mean, you, you, you had so many great fights there. And that was, who would think a woman's fight would fit right in? It fit right in. It was The place incredible. was as electric as any crowd I've ever seen oh. for a fight. It had everything. And it was exciting, and the fight was action packed. No, that's I'd right love there. to see that, them. I right love there. to see three minute rounds at that level. Those girls are so good. Like two minutes, I think, is doing them an injustice. Like, what what are we doing? It's a fight is a fight. It's the same distance for both participants. They, I, they, I they would have done well with three minute rounds. It would have changed things because um, there were there was some spots there where 
Uh, Serrano, much stronger, the better puncher, but Katie Taylor of Magnificent, both of them were magnificent, but Katie Taylor of Magnificent, Olympic gold medalist, one of the greatest female fighters of all time. Um, she, you know, she's boxing, she's counter punching, incredible comeback. She was behind in a fight, she was hurt in a fight. Yep. Incredible comeback, incredible fight by both of them, as you just said. And, um, but if the rounds were longer, uh, some of those rounds that, that Taylor, there was one or two in particular where she barely survived because of the power and the relentlessness of Serrano. If those yep. rounds were longer, they, it would have been a different fight probably. Or I very so. possibly. Very possibly. But anyway, um, definitely, definitely uh, that, that fight has to be mentioned with it. Uh, Taylor and Serrano definitely has to. There's no doubt about it. Hey guys, want to take a minute to give a shout out to today's sponsor, Athletic Greens, now called AG1. Check them out at athleticgreens.com slash atlas. Use our promo code, you'll get 10 free travel packs with your first purchase. Guys, this stuff is awesome. It's basically a multivitamin in the form of a green drink. It uses only whole food sourced ingredients, which to me is the key. It's like an insurance policy for your body's health and immunity system. Mix a scoop of this in 10 ounces of water first thing in the morning, shake it up, down it goes, easy peasy. Like I said, I consider it an insurance policy. Even if I'm eating the healthiest of diets, I wanna make sure I'm getting all my correct vitamins, nutrients, minerals, probiotics, prebiotics. Athletic Greens guts has got everything. It's an all-in-one drink. Take this, you don't need anything else. Athleticgreens.com slash Atlas to get you 10 free travel packs. The travel packs are invaluable. I take them with me everywhere I go. Check them out, athleticgreens.com. Use the promo code Atlas. Take it from there. Knockout of the year. What do you got? I got a couple uh, top contenders. Curious to hear what you think here. Uh, yeah. L listen, let me first say that knockout of the year could also be Lee, that doesn't happen too often, but it could be Lee and Conlon again. That, that's how devastating Lee's knockout was. Um, because, uh, you know, I, I described it a moment ago. Uh, you knock a guy stiff and he goes through the ropes. That, that's got to be a candidate for knockout of the year. Uh, the, there's no doubt about it. But I'll go, to, I'll go to other places. There's a few of them. But I'll go with... Khalid Plant, his knockout in the ninth round, and he's another guy who probably doesn't get enough love from me sometimes. Um, Khalid Plant, a knockout in the ninth round over Anthony Durrell. Uh, that was with the left hook, I believe. Incredible, devastating knockout. Look, Durrell's passed himself, um, but Plant really planted it on him, if you will, if you pardon the, the pun. Um, and, and I can't help it, Ken. I'm going to let you add it to right after this, but I had to put a couple right up there, almost like like A and B entry, like a horse race where you have an entry, A and B entry. Yep. Uh, Deontay Wilder has knocked out over Robert Hellenius with the right oh, yeah. hand. We know he knocks guys out with the right hand, but he used his legs this time. This time yep. he used his legs to set it up. That differentiated this knockout for him, and maybe it shows you that he's you can teach an old dog new tricks. Maybe. He's got a new trainer, so maybe. And then the other one, I know that the class of competition wasn't near what the guy that was delivering the knockout was, but Terrence Crawford knocking out um, David Avanesian. Uh, uh, how do you say his name? Avanesian? Uh, yeah, Avanesian. His knockout over Avanesian um, from the southpaw position, I know he's dom so he dominated the fight at the end. Uh, Avenician, to his credit, came in there and tried like hell, um, but he was overmatched, outgunned. But what a knockout! Left uppercut from the southpaw position, left uppercut picks his head up, it hurts him, but it picks his head up, and then a beautiful short, crisp. I always talk about the short punches of Joe Lewis. This short right hook from the southpaw position to finish the fight, to finish the night by Crawford was incredible. First of all, it was right on time. The chin comes up, bop! The, the right hook was right there, right on time, fast, no hesitation. And like I said, you could have landed in, in, a, in a phone booth. I mean, it, it was that short. It was that compact. So 
those those are the ones for me. Uh, you know, you could you could pick from them anywhere you want. I put Plant up there at the top. The only the only thing I didn't like about Caleb Plant, and he's a Nashville guy, I like to see him do well. I, I could have done without him shoveling dirt on. No, on, I, no, over no, the no. Hill, Listen, I, I left that, that out. No, no, I left that out because I went purely. That's kind of gotcha. like whether or not. That's kind of like, and I'm glad you brought it up, Ken. You're the man. I, I, I. I'm glad. See, I'm going to make a point here. I take that a little bit like Pete Rose not being allowed in the Hall of Fame. You know, Pete Rose is the best hitter of all time uh, or the most. Uh, if he's not the maybe Ted Williams from Boston. Boston, can you believe it? From Boston. Anyway, <laughs> um, uh, happy New Year. Ken, uh, I, I mentioned Ted Williams. So, uh, but as far as amount of hits, there's no disputing it. Pete Rose is the hit king, the most hits ever. And he beat Ty Cobb's record and all that. But he's not in the Hall of Fame because we understand because of gambling and, and you know, that stuff. We get it. We understand that they, they held a very strict standard. And, you know, it's about the integrity of the game. You can't have that. Okay. So he's not in there. But he's still, for me, he's still the greatest, you know, hitter of all time as far as amount of hits. Uh, and that doesn't change. That doesn't get disputed. That doesn't get wiped away. So I kind of feel that way, and I'm with you. I feel the same way about Plant. That was horrendous. That was that was terrible what he did. Terrible judgment. Terrible. You hope that that doesn't speak to beyond. Uh, you hope that that doesn't speak to a person and any connection to his makeup beyond a a, a a stupid moment beyond a stupid moment when his adrenaline was flowing right after a fight where there was a lot of bad blood and there was there was bad blood both sides and and he did something stupid without thinking you hope that that's it that that it was just we all make mistakes that was a mistake it was a it was a a bad mistake but it was a mistake that he made again at uh, at, at a moment at a moment where he wasn't thinking. Well, like I said, he just finished scoring a knockout. There was a lot of bad blood, and he and he's and he does something. I would hope he regretted it. Um, and again, I would hope he's better than that. But again, just like the Pete Rose analogy I just made, that Pete Rose has the most hits. There's no disputing that. That knockout was devastating. There's no disputing that. No matter what his antics were afterwards, that knockout was was. Incredible! It was, uh, you know, it, it was. It, it it brings the house down. I mean, it it quiets everything when you see a knockout like that. Like, oh, whoa, you know, it's yeah, like the I, lights go. It's like the lights. It's like pulling a plug in a room and the lights go out. But anyway, yeah. I hear you. I, uh, I hear you. What I know of Caleb and my experiences in the time I've been around, the times I've been around him, it's out of character. And like you said, I'm willing to give him the benefit for the doubt. I just think it has to be mentioned because. You know, it wasn't, he beat an over-the-hill Darrell. There was a lot of bad blood. But you would think you get the satisfaction of knocking the guy out completely cold, unconscious. You don't have to do that. But nevertheless, maybe he just made a mistake. We'll give him the benefit of the doubt. The only other uh, the only other knockout I'd add to the list was um, uh, Noya Inouye's knockout of uh, Nonito Denaire in the second in their rematch. 100%. 100%. Vicious you're knockout. right. No, no, you're right. Again, an over-the-hill Donaire. That's that's yep. that's we we call it as it is, an over the hill donor, over the hill guys, older guys, veteran guys, great guys, don't do well in rematches when they lost the first one to a younger mm -hmm. great fighter. They don't. I could point to a lot of examples. One of them is Rocky Marciano and the great Jersey Joe Walcott. Jersey Joe Walcott, and there's a lot of them. Or Guayo and Pryor. There's a lot of them. Was the was the Tarver knockout of Roy Jones in their second fight? Antonio yeah. Tarver yeah. when he knocked out. Yeah. Oh, I think that's, that yeah, that was a vicious. Uh, yeah, vicious that was knockout. the second one. I uh, that's a good point. I, yeah, that was the second one, right? Yeah, yeah, that was a good point. Um, uh, there's a lot of them. Like I said, there's there's a there's a history of them. And Jersey Joe Walcott and Marciano is a great one. Thirteen rounds. Uh, the great Walcott, who was heavyweight champ at the time, he's ahead on all scorecards. You know, in the thirteenth round, the only way Marciano can win is by knockout. Marciano knocks him out. Uh, you know, devastating. Uh, and the second fight, the rematch, some people think it's going to be another great one. Nope. Nope. The old Walcott, he can't do it. 
he only got one of those magical nights in you at that age. And he couldn't do it no more, you know, mentally or physically. And I'd say mentally first, you know, he figured he did everything he could. What's he going to do this time? He didn't win the first time. What's he going to do this time? And he gets knocked out in the first round by Walcott. I mean, by Marciano. And then same thing with Oquayo and Pryor. Great fight. What a goal. 14 rounds, whatever went. Great fight. Unbelievable fight uh, with the great Oquayo who was older um, than Pryor. But he, he does everything he can. He still gets knocked out by Pryor, the first fight, second fight, nowhere near being competitive uh, as the first one. And, of course, Pryor knocks him out. And as you said, uh, also, uh, in a way, and Donaire. And, and, and as you also said, uh, 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 Jones, Roy Jones Jr., and, that was um, um, and, no, and, um, November of 03. Roy Jones gets a majority decision at Mandalay Tom. Bay over Antonio Tarver. Uh, six months later, in May of 04, Antonio Tarver, same venue, Mandalay Bay. Antonio Tarver knocks him out cold for the first time. Roy then went on to lose about six fights after that. Once their chin got cracked, it was like the beginning of Glenn the Glenn Clark Johnson. Roy. Glenn Clark yeah. Johnson knocked him out after that. Yep. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, immediately after. Then Antonio beat him with a unanimous decision right after that. He lost three in a row, Roy Jones, who at the time of the first Antonio Tarver, he looked unbeatable prior to that first Antonio Tarver fight. He was just destroying everyone. He would there do was, whatever there's, he wanted. There's, there's probably an X factor in there. We don't make no excuses, but we point out everything. We X-ray everything over here. We do the CAT scan. And, you know, Jones had gone up to heavyweight to beat John Ruiz for one of those heavyweight belts, yep. and they came back down in weight. Going up, especially later in your life, going up in weight like that, and then you know putting on all that, not just weight, but muscle, and then having to take it off and come back down to light heavyweight, that, that, that could be a problem. That can be a physical problem. Um, and, and you could almost connect his downward spiral a little bit. Yep. Also, when he got older, his reflexes weren't the same. And he was a fighter like Ali who depended on reflexes. That first Tarver fight that he won by majority decision was the first fight after John Ruiz. So he yeah, beat, won a controversial decision, then got knocked out cold due to the probably with having something yeah, to do 100%. with the weight gain and loss. And when you get older, Ken, and you're dependent like Ali and like Jones, you're dependent on reflexes and speed, timing, you know, to get away from punches. You do things not technically correct. You just do them because of your greatness in those areas. You get away with it. And then you get a little old and your reflexes betray you. They betray you a little bit. And and you're not getting away. Those punches, you went like this and you went like this and you went like this. And they just miss. Now they land. Yep. Then now they land. And, right. and now the, the things you do wrong from a technical approach you start to pay for a price because uh, now now you get caught. But anyway, those are great. That was a good conversation. Those were great examples. I, I don't see anybody arguing with those. Um, but you know what? There'll be someone out there. Fight the <laughs> I was just going to say, uh, are you crazy? <laughs> There'll be 100 people with their own fight of the year. They'll be quoting some amateur fight from like the, the Polish Golden Gloves in Warsaw that we didn't yeah. see. But yeah. with that, let's talk about fighter of the year. There's a bunch of candidates here, but who do you like for fighter of the year? This one, I really do think that there's only one. I think it's got to be Bevel. Uh, Bevel, Bevel. Am I pronouncing his name for the new I year? I call him Dimitri Bevel. Yeah, so Bevel. Bevel uh, I, I don't see it being anyone else. I mean, he goes and he beats Canelo, you know, even though Convincingly. I, yeah, conv <laughs> convincingly, he he probably wins eleven out of twelve rounds, and he wins by two points. So, oh my god! <laughs> uh, but jeez, uh, uh, hopefully that could change in the new year. But uh, don't don't hold your breath on Not that a one. Not chance. Uh, uh, but. Fight of the year. I can't see anyone else can. Bevo uh, beating not only Canelo, if that wasn't good enough, he also beats the undefeated Gilberto Ramirez, who was a former super middleweight champion, um, you know, who moved up. Uh, maybe a maybe a runner up for me would be Devin Haney, who beat Cambosis twice in a row. You know, not just that he beat Cambosis, who beat, you know, who did beat uh, Lopez, Teofimo Lopez, who's in the downward spiral now. But not only that, but this is a guy 
I mean, Haney had to go to Australia in his home twice. country and beat him back to back, back to back twice. And the first time without his father wasn't allowed there to the last second, wasn't allowed there to train with him while he went over there because of a visa situation. So I don't know. I, I got to consider Haney up there, you know, runner up. But there's really only one winner. I, I can't see. I know people find anything to argue over uh, and to disagree with you over, you know, but Bevo, for me, is the sure, the, just the, the sure shot winner um, in, in that category. What do you think, Ken? I agree with you. I was going to say I had those two guys written down in the men's and in the women's. I had Clarissa Shields and... Um, and uh, Katie Taylor and Amanda. Again, Serrano. you stole my thunder. I'm sorry. No, you stole my. No, no, it's, uh, but it's good. It, it's good. It's good. But uh, definitely, definitely, uh, definitely, um, I'm kissing and waving goodbye to my family that's going out. My my son. One of the things that made it a great New Year was I have my whole family here. Teddy's been working, of course, in the NFL with the Raiders for. for the last 14 years, 12 over there, two years with Cleveland. And this is the first year in, in many, 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 many years he got here for Christmas. They were here for Christmas and New Year's. We had a whole family here, my three grandchildren, our three grandchildren, you know, Teddy the Fourth, Joseph and Mara, uh, five-year-old, a four-year-old, a three-year-old. The house was just it was noisy it was noisy and <laughs> loving Lo noisy and loving with all our family here and they're leaving now teddy's flying back to vegas so i was kissing him goodbye uh him and his family but getting back to stealing my thunder here we are um yeah clarissa shields a hundred percent um as far as fight of the year she's got to be right up there uh there's no doubt about that uh she goes and she beats savannah marshall uh, and and puts on a boxing clinic, puts yep. on a, a really a boxing clinic, uh, and that fight wasn't close. They again, just like Bevo and Canelo, they the judges tried to make it close. It shouldn't have been close. I thought she won probably, uh, probably every uh, all but one round. Probably all but one round. Um, I mean that's how that's how dominating she was and counter punching and she really did she she put a clinic class on uh you know she's 12 and 0 she was fighting marshall who uh katie marshall at the time no savannah, marshall was savannah. 12 and, yeah i'm sorry savannah marshall uh was i believe 12 and 0 and shields is now 13 and 0 yeah i got it right so the other one who would be fight of the year another runner-up would also be in a woman's category of katie taylor i mean you could put her and clarissa shields right up there right behind bevel i i again i don't think anybody beats bevel men or women but um for what he did in the year but katie taylor's performance as we talked about earlier against serrano uh winning that fight with that atmosphere and Clarissa Shields winning her fight and the way she did it, like I said, just just putting on a master class of boxing of the sweet science. And both of both the girls of both of the girls and Devin Haney all had to do it in uh the other guy in the other person's country. And I'd argue that Bevel had to do it in uh Canelo's country as well. Yeah, it's true. True, because Bevel, of course, um, coming from Eastern Europe, from Russia, uh, from or from that area, one of the former Soviet satellite S countries states. over there, states over there. Yep. Um, definitely 100%. Uh, he has to come over here and beat Canelo and beat the golden boy, who, the golden goose who lays the golden eggs. Uh, again, what did he have to do? We used to make a joke in boxing. How are you going to beat this guy, you know, the way it's going to be rigged against you? Well, uh, y you know, you got to... You got to knock him out and you hope you don't get disqualified, right? Yeah, uh, we exactly. used to make that joke. Well, you know what? That joke almost came to fruition with, with Bevel, where, you know, he, he wins, like I said, I thought he won 11 or 12 rounds. And most people did. I think most honest people um, did. And, and that know what they're watching, I think they felt the same way. But then to make it, what, 115, 113 on the cards? He he 
it, it fell into that joke about boxing, which is of unfortunate. Course. There's there's a joke about that that you got to knock him out and hope you don't get disqualified, you know. Or <laughs> or the other joke was you got to win every round and hope you get a split decision, and that's <laughs> that's pretty much almost exactly what happened. So mm-hmm. anyway. My man. All right. Let's jump into um, upset of the year. Who was your favorite upset of the year? I think for the upset of the year, you're probably going to be thinking about Bevo and Canelo again. It happens sometimes that you can win more than one category in these kind of contests um, because it's just the way it is. I mean... I didn't think it was an upset. Here's the, here's the little bit of a catch to it for me. I thought Bevo was going to beat him. I actually said on our air, what I didn't think was that he could get the win. Which 100%. You did. I think when you factor in what everyone knows to be true is that he'd have to beat the brakes off him to get the, the, the decision, which is what he did. No one thought that he would beat him that decisively. And, and if it was any closer, like, like you just said, he wouldn't have got the win. So 100%. I think when so, you factor in all the variables, yeah, that was the sub- most, sh- if not upset, most shocking win of the year or, or one of the top two or three. Yeah, definitely, Ken, because again, for, with, with, you have to look at, both of those dynamics here where, yeah, you know, he's a huge underdog. He's fighting a golden goose. Uh, nobody gives him a chance. Again, I really thought he was going to win the fight. I thought he could beat him. I said it on our air. And he goes, but I didn't think that he could actually get out of the arena intact with the belt. And he did. Um, he did because he won so convincingly, which he had to do, as we just said. If he didn't win it that convincingly, he doesn't get it, obviously, as as the scores would indicate. So Bevo over Canelo. I have an, a runner-up, Hector Luis Garcia, who could win this award next year. He could win it next year because in case anybody forgot, next week he's fighting Tank Davis, and I think he's got a chance to upset Tank Davis, okay? I think he's got a chance. He pulled, not because of the upset he pulled, because he pulled off an upset against a very untested, undefeated, untested, and overrated Chris Colbert. He did, (coughs) because the network that he was fighting on at the time, Showtime, they were overrating him. They were going gaga, goo goo, blah, blah, blah. You know, they were mumbling all over the place about how he was the next best thing since sliced bread and Coca Cola together. And he wasn't. He wasn't. And and he hadn't been tested. And um, he had a trainer in the corner that was lying to him during the fight, telling him this guy's going to quit. And he's going to quit? Really? Hector Luis Garcia was going to quit. Well, he didn't quit. He beat the crap out of Colbert. But. It was one of those huge upsets because because of all everything I just touched on connected with Colbert, him being the anointed one. He was going to be this fighter they were all talking about. He was undefeated, you know. Um, they had built him up. Nobody gave Garcia a chance, and and most people didn't even see the fight. A lot of people didn't even see it. So. The runner-up, Hector Luis Garcia. And the reason I think it's significant that I put him in there as the runner-up, besides that he beat Colbert, where he wasn't supposed to even be in a fight to have a chance, but he's a hell of a good, solid fighter, and he's got this huge fight coming up next week with Tank Davis. And as I said when I introduced him a moment ago as the runner-up, he could win out with outright winner's award Next year, or this year, I should say, when we do it, you know, when we do it next year for this year's award, he can win it. I mean, he's got a shot to beat Tank Davis. Now, look, Tank Davis is, is, I mean, he's a solid fighter in all dimensions. He's not just a puncher. He's a solid fighter and a southpaw. He's a solid fighter in all dimensions. But uh, this Luis Garcia... He's a solid fighter. He's not the puncher, but he's a solid fighter. He, he's he got a huge amateur pedigree with him, uh, behind him. Uh, he's got the confidence. He's got the know-how. He's got the ability. He's technically sound. Uh, he's along the lines of what I was describing earlier when I said that 
Some guys have the neon talents. Tank Davis has those where they shine and we all get goo goo gaga over them, you know, where you see the power, you see the speed, whatever it is. But the dependability, the quiet talents, dependable, consistent, solid, technically solid, you know, reliable. Hector Luis Garcia has those. So anyway, that's that's my uh that's my two. What do you say, Ken? Uh, what say I, you? I agree with you exactly. I was I I, I kind of had a brain slip. I was gonna say Sandor Martino Mar Sandor Martino over Mikey Garcia, but then that was at the end of last year, and then Rob was reminding me of um, Tiafimo uh, losing to uh, George Camposis, but that was also yes. at the end of 21, 100%. both of them. So 100%. I think those are the two runaways there. Um, but let's talk about the prospect of the year. Who's your favorite prospect in 2022? Who are we looking for big things out of in 23? All right, prospect of the year, Keyshawn Davis, Olympic silver medalist, um, he hasn't been tested yet, but he has the pedigree in the amateurs. Obviously, he won a silver medal in the Olympics. He has the pedigree, the the background as far as experience in the amateurs, uh, confidence that gets bred from that experience and from that success. He's got the talent, and he's schooled properly from a technical, fundamental standpoint. Um, so... Uh, again, he and he's with the machine. You know, he's over there with top rank at ESPN. He's with the machine. They're gonna feed him all the right guys. You know, they're feeding him raw meat right now. Um, even uh, one of the guys he fought was an experienced guy, but he was he was a guy that was definitely definitely the sun had set on him. Uh, but he went the distance with him. Going the distance with an experienced guy is gonna make him uh, better for the future. Uh, it's it's definitely something that's going to wind up boding well for him, uh, getting that experience, getting those rounds under his belt, uh, instead of just knocking guys out, you know, that he shouldn't even be in the ring with in 30 seconds. But he's a talented guy. I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna throw in. Well, no, I'm gonna let you take it from there because you're gonna lead to the next thing. So go ahead. That's my prospect of the year. Um, what say? What say you, my man? I want to see you first what you say for the new face of boxing. I've got I've got a pick for prospect slash fate new face, but I want to hear what you think. Who's who you think is the new face of boxing? All right, here it is. He convinced me, baby. He really did. Um, his name is Frank Martin. Uh, I, I again full disclosure. We we you know we tell it as it is. Uh, I, I didn't know nothing about this guy or much about this guy. A couple of weeks ago, I saw him on Showtime, and I saw him fight another. He's undefeated. I saw him fight another undefeated fight, 24-0, Michael Rivera. Um, and and he, just, he just took him apart piece by piece. He put on, again, he put on a, a, a boxing sh clinic. Uh, he's a southpaw. He, he can... He controls range. He uses his legs. He's not tall in stature. You know, he's a little short maybe for the weight. But then again, so is Tank Davis. Um, he's a 135-pounder. Uh, he's now 17-0 and with 12 knockouts. But uh, nobody had really talked about him before. Uh, he wasn't heard of much before. But obviously, uh, he could fight way before Teddy Atlas saw him. But once Teddy Atlas saw him, he's uh, blowing a trumpet about him because he's everything that I talk about in boxing. He knows how to fight. Uh, he's he's solid in all the quiet areas of talent. And he's uh, he's got some of the loud talents too. He's not a huge puncher, but uh, he's, uh, he's a guy that technically his, his training, his training, his trainer has done a tremendous job. It's very evident. Uh, he's solid fundamentally. He's solid in all the areas he's supposed to be solid. He knows what the hell he's doing when he steps inside that, that squared circle, that chamber of truth. Uh, he, Again, he's got the quiet talents of being steady and reliable, uh, consistent. He... He uh he could he could go get you he could box he could he like I said he controls range really beautifully with his legs, uh he counter punches he does he does everything that a fighter is supposed to do when he's a well rounded fighter and a well schooled fighter, uh I think he fits right in, right now 
with the monsters of the 135 pound class. That's how good, that's how taken I was by him. Where you're going to be hearing about this guy. Like I said, you never really heard about him before. You're going to hear about him now because he fits right in there with a class that might be the most talented class in boxing right now, but he fits in there with the with the Tank Davises, with the Ryan Garcias, with the with the Haneys, with the Lomachenkos. Um, matter of fact, I would love to see him. Shakur Stevenson, who's a very talented guy at 130 pounds, he's got the you know he holds the hardware at 130. He hasn't been really tested, right? I would yep. love to see him. He's probably going to move up. He's a young guy. Uh, Stevenson, he's young, he's big, he's big for 130, he's definitely going to move up to 135, there's no doubt uh, about it in my mind, I would love to see him move up, and you know, he's uh, he's coming from the 130 with, with a title, let him move up to 135, and take on Frank Martin, uh, testing the waters in that division, no uh, chance. Uh, I, I, I would love to see it, I think Martin is that quietly good yeah i say it again quietly good where he could he could get right in there with the Shakur Stevenson who's a very talented guy quite frankly he ran out of guys to fight at 130 there's nobody good enough you know with his style Stevenson's style with his abilities um he's he's got to move up to 130 not only because he's too big i think but there's there's nobody competitive at 130 for him so he's got to move up to 135 uh i think Martin fits in with everybody there, which is a hell of a compliment when I tell you that that division is is the most stacked division right now in boxing. It reminds me some ways of the way the welterweight division was back when boxing was at its healthiest since the golden years of the 30s and the 40s. And when the 80s, when boxing was on network TV, where the best fighters were fighting each other, actually fighting each other, actually fighting each other, and you had so many great fighters like Roberto Duran and Sugar Ray, Rob, uh, Sugar Ray Leonard and, and uh, Tommy Hearns and Pernell Whitaker and Aaron Pryor. And I mean, you go on, Marvin Hagler. You, you just could go on and on and on. And you had all these great fighters. And like I said, the greatest thing about it, they were actually fighting each other. That is, That was an unbelievable, that was the welterweight division. This lightweight division now is the strongest division with that kind of talent that I've seen since the welterweight division that I just talked about of the 80s. Of course, the difference is they don't fight each other. You know, that, that, uh, that's, that's a big difference, unfortunately. But um, anyway, that's my new face of the year to look out for, Mr. Frank Martin. Go ahead. You go with it now, kid. My two uh, two prospects or face new face of boxing. I like this kid, Richard Torres. He's only four and zero, but Olympic silver medalist at heavyweight, heavyweight American yeah. heavyweight. Yeah, and yeah. I like uh, I like Exciting this kid, style. Jared Anderson, uh, heavyweight, thirteen and 0, 13 knockouts. Those records don't really say much. I mean, Richard Torres is fighting guys who candidly don't even look like they've sparred before but he did win a silver medal in the olympics and you're not faking your way through that uh i like those two guys i love the heavyweight division always brings the fans so i i picked two guys from heavyweights and two american heavyweights is good for boxing uh in general uh whether people like it or not that's always a good thing to have more eyeballs on the sport I like um, it, Ken. I, I like it. I like it. I'm going to let you finish, but I just like it. I like Torres' style. You know, he's exciting. He's fun to watch. You know, he's Super not aggressive. Uh, uh, yeah, he's not tall. He's got to be aggressive. And, um, you know, uh, and, and you just touched on it. You know, he, he won a silver medal. I, I remind people out there that Joe Joyce, that's another forgotten guy for the most part, he won a silver medal too. He's in the heavyweight division. He's over in London, and he deserves a shot. I think he's going to finally get some kind of big shot. Um, I like him. Uh, he reminds me of uh, George Foreman in some ways, Joe Joyce. But Torres, again, following in the same footsteps, silver medalist, and... Uh, but uh, uh, Joe Joy's exciting style, Torrey's exciting style. So Very. go ahead, finish up. That, I agree with you. That's not bad. 
That's all I got for you. I wanted to talk to you about the uh, wish list for uh, 2023. Three fights you'd love to see in, uh, let's start with boxing and then we'll jump to the UFC. But three fights you want to see in boxing. I think a couple of them are very obvious, but uh, what do you got? Okay. I mean, the first one has to be on everyone's list, right? Well, I'd like to look. Uh, they used to say, the old timers would say, boxing goes as the heavyweight division goes. They would always say that, Ken. Uh, you know, it's the head. It's the head of the snake. And so I'd love to see Usyk and Fury. I really would. Looks like I, we're going to get it. It feels like we're going to get it. It speaks to what the sweet science is supposed to be all about. You know, it's that, and, and to that old, old adage it's not the size of the man in the fight it's the size of the fight in the man you know that that age-old adage and and about that that old age-old argument can the good little man beat the good big man and it, it it's the perfect scenario to answer some of those questions and to speak to some of those adages um it's the perfect fight for that it really is uh, Uzik, I, I'll put it simple. He just knows how to do one thing. He know, yeah, he box. He's got good legs. He's got pretty good head movement. Yes, he does. Uh, you know, his speed's not sensational. His power's not sensational. It's there, but it's not sensational. But you know what's sensational about him? His ability to win. That's sensational. You know, he won a gold medal in the Olympic. He unified all the cruiserweight belts just like Holyfield did. He's probably the greatest cruiserweight champ besides Holyfield uh, of all time. And he just knows how to win. He just knows how to win. And Fury knows how to win. And he's bigger. He's huge. He's a behemoth. He's a... He, he's <laughs> So, yeah. Um, Fury also has skill. He's not just big. He also has skill. Uh, you know, he, he sometimes moves around like a lightweight in a heavyweight's body. Uh, Usyk could, at his disadvantage of size, usually I always say, we look at the disadvantages when we're talking about catch weight fights, we're talking about fights where a bigger guy's fighting a smaller guy. We say, oh, the bigger guy, we look at the advantages of him. We forget about the advantages of the smaller guy, that he's quicker. He might be smarter. You know, he's more agile. We, we don't look at that. Now, that's hard to kind of make that argument in this fight because Usyk, even though he's supposed to have those advantages being a smaller guy, which he did over Joshua, but against Fury, the bigger guy, Fury is good in those areas too. He's agile, he's fast, he's quick, he's good on his legs. So it's going to be a hugely interesting, intriguing matchup. It, it really is. And again, if the heavyweight division is exciting and interesting, the rest of boxing is healthier. If that's healthy, the rest of boxing is healthy. Now, I, I passed on Spence Crawford. I know that that's the one you expected me to say. And I'll tell you, I'll tell you why I passed on it. Because... You, you just get, you get a little down about these fights, and they don't happen. You know, they, uh, Crawford's now a free agent, so there's a better chance of it happening, obviously, than it was when he was with Top Rank and Spencer's with PBC, because uh, both both promoters are going to keep it in-house. They won't go across the street and make the fight that the fans want, that the sport wants. They're greedy. They just want to control everything and they want to make all the money themselves. So unless it's a Pacquiao-Mayweather scenario where the money is so huge that they have to get together, which they did for that fight five years too late, unfortunately, uh, they don't get together. And this might be the same scenario. It might be five years too late. I don't know. Because neither guy is real young. So I, I, they're at their prime. But the fight ain't happening. It was supposed to be. It's going to happen. It might happen. Gonna, and now, again, it's not. And I think it becomes less and less likely the more time goes by. Especially if there's these new startup promoters and networks, Ken, who are willing to pay $10 million dollars for for guys like Crawford and Crawford's great, he deserves all the money in the world. Um, but as long as Crawford and these other fighters at that level, you know these other stars at that level, 
they could get that kind of money to pick their own music? I mean, really? I mean, why not? Why not? What's, what's going to really compel them to take the risk? I know we talk about legacy. We talk about what we want and their legacy, and they want to be known as the great, all of that. And I'm sure it's true with both these fighters. They're proud fighters. But at the end of the day, $10 million speaks kind of loud too. So when you're getting a chance to, you know, fight guys that are not, you know, I hate to say that uh, it's, it's a layup or it's a slam dunk. Anything could happen in a ring. I get it to a certain extent, right? But when you're getting $10 million to fight guys that you're completely outclass, I mean, I think you're going to probably be tempted to take that. Um, so I don't know if that's going to happen. Obviously, that would be on the wish list, Ken. Um, you know, and also, I think I'm going to go, listen, you did something dangerous, you and Rob. I know about this. I know about it, Ken. Because I have grandchildren. You don't take grandchildren <laughs> to a candy store and tell them that they can get anything they want because <laughs> you know what they want everything in the store Ken they want <laughs> you you just unleashed me in a candy store and I want all the candy I want it all so forgive me for a moment going off script um, I'm gonna add I'm gonna add a, another one Bevo and Better Beef oh that's what I was gonna say you stole my thunder science well, it's about time. Science <laughs> versus power and will. I mean, you, the X factor here is that, and this is the X factor again, Bevo, although not as easy to see this talent because of his style of fighting, he has what Better Beef has too, which most people don't, that great, great will. And he has that too. So... In other words, the pressure that Better Beaver breaks people with, I don't think it's going to break uh, Mr. Bevo like Rusty Pipes. It's, it's, so for me, it's an incredibly intriguing fight. And then, again, I can't help it. I see chocolate down that aisle. I see bubble gum. I see gummy. Oh, my God, there's gummy bears here. Uh, uh, okay, <laughs> gummy bears. Better Vitas versus Canelo. And and here's my reason. C Canelo cannot claim to be the king at 168 until he fights Better Vitas. This would be the epitome of the man with the silver spoon. I know the Canelo haters are going to get out there. That's okay. Hey, why should this year be any different than any other year? Just because it's a new year. Why should it be different? Um, but... I think it's the man with the silver spoon, Canelo, versus the guy who's been eating with his hands, which is Benavides. And I don't think we're going to see it. I would love to see it. And I, oh, I see some of those straws with the sugar in them. Oh, <laughs> oh, oh I love that. I love the straws with the sugar. Here we go. Ennis versus Crawford. And let me, let me tell you why. Let's see once and for all is this beautiful and powerful car, which I'm saying is obviously Ennis, as good on the track as it is on the side streets that it's been racing on. In, <laughs> and, That's a perfect in, description. <laughs> in other words, right? Is, it, is he real? Or, you know, is he just Macy's window dressing at Christmas time? You know, and I, I'll throw in one other uh, little analogy there. And a little saying, my son Teddy would always tell me about the late, great Willie Brown, the late, great Oakland Raider, who was, uh, who was with those great Oakland Raider teams. He was in the backfield. They were unbelievable, those guys, in the defensive backfield. And Willie Brown was a character. My son really liked him. They used to spend a, little, a lot of time together. And he used to say to my son, when such things would come up, he'd say, hey, don't tell me you're pregnant. Show me the baby. <laughs> and that it's time to show the baby. You know what I mean? We, uh, don't, don't, don't tell me you're pregnant. I want to see the baby. I, I want to see, I want to see really, really the goods now with Ennis. I'm tired of seeing this big giant guy 
just decapitate guys in the ring. I, I want to see him in there with someone that we can really say, oh, wow, yeah, 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 he's got, he's got that too. He's got that too. And listen, I'm in the candy store. Deontay Wilder against Joshua. Um, I, you know, clean up the heavyweight deck by getting rid of one and, and make the very protected. And again, Ken, it's New Year's, but why should things change that much? The, our great brothers and sisters across the pond, I got to give them something to hate at me. I got to give them something. I got to, right? Why, why wait? Why wait a day beyond the New Year? And, but I think it's time to make the very protected and spoiled, privileged, rich Joshua actually take a fight that's both dangerous and he doesn't want to take. In other words, make him walk in his shoes like all the other commoners, you know, who aren't as privileged. And, you know, and again, my English brothers and sisters, they're going to blow another gasket for me daring to tell such unpopular truths, you know, over what I'm saying about Joshua. But before they blow a casket, let me tell you, I say the same thing about Canelo. And of course, the great Mexican fans are going to say, they're going to come <laughs> after me over that. But I say the same thing about Canelo. He's, he's protected. He's privileged. You know, he's overrated. Yeah, I said it. Joshua and him are overrated. They are. I know Canelo's starting to slide a little bit, but still, he, he's overrated. Happy New Year. You know, Happy New Year, everybody. Um, but I had to throw those in there. I'm sorry. Uh, I, I went crazy in the candy store. Um, I don't think you're going to see... Uh, you, I don't think I can put Loma and Haney in there. A lot of people are going to say that's on the wish list. I'm not putting it. I think the fight's going to happen because they're both with the same promoter now. So it's an in-house fight. It's easy to make. It's going to happen. But here's the problem. Loma's too old. He's too small. And he's too old. He, he's starting to slide now. I'm not making excuses. I love Haney. But I think Haney now with his talent and his size, and he's only 24 years old, I think this fight for Loma should have been a Loma four years ago, at least three years ago. Not now. I, I really don't. I think we're going to see it, but it's not on my wish list at this point because I just don't think you're going to get a, a prime Loma anymore. Uh, you know, I don't. Um, so anyway... I'm sorry I went into that candy store, but can I go a little farther in the candy store, Ken? Sure. Of in, a way, in a way, and S Stephen Fulton. Fulton, most people are not going to have that on the list, but you got to put in a way on there. You got a pure boxer in Fulton, sweet science versus the monster. I mean, come on. That's, that's like you go to the movies to see that, wouldn't you? I mean, the... And, and the monster was probably created in a science lab because he knows what the hell he's doing besides being a monster puncher. That would be really interesting. In a way, he's a 118-pound champ. I, he's going to move up. This would be at 122 pounds where, where the top gun is Fulton. I would love to see it. And again, candy store, baby. Joe Joyce and Wilder. Just because I like thunder showers. Because... <laughs> You know, you. I would have loved to see George Foreman and Ernie Chavis. You know, two big guys, two big punches. Joe Joyce is George Foreman. Wilder is Ernie Chavis with that powerful right hand. Same thing. And I'll throw in one more. Can't help it. And this is going to shock and amaze people that I'm going to put this in there because it would not be normally on my wish list because I don't think it makes a great fight. But Jamal, Charlo, and Andre, not because, as I just said, it's a good fight to watch, because I don't think it would be good, because anyone who Andre fights, it won't necessarily be an attractive fight to watch. His style is anti-fan friendly. It can be boring. But he, he wins. He, he's tall. He's long. He knows what he's doing. And I want this just because I'd like to see both of these prima donnas, 
Yeah, I say it. I say it. See, I, yeah, I, you know, I, I, I don't care about the arrows that are going to come back. But both of these prima donnas, and I got respect for them in the ring, but they've been truly protected and spoiled or treated like they were born into royalty. I like to see them finally in a risky fight and get tested. You know, this one is really a payback for all the guys who had to go down the dirt roads to get there and not the paved ones because these guys have been, you know, pretty well protected. I mean, anyone who denies that don't know, they're not following boxing. So, or they're just fans. They're just drinking fan juice and they don't want to hear it. All right, fine. <laughs> you heard it. You heard it. Ken, what do you got I want to hear you. I want to hear you. you. Uh, you've, that pretty much covers it. I mean, I had... Um fights i wanted to see i had um fury fury Usyk, which i think gets done in better bia versus bevel and obviously spence crawford and then at 135 anyone versus anyone in the top five well that's that's well said i mean anyone versus anyone they're all monsters i said it you know obviously uh you know with the talent there with with i mentioned them all you know who they are every one of them I, I, and if what's his name, of course, Stevenson wants to move up. I don't want to see him fight anything less than the top guys. He's yes. already got uh, he's already got a belt at 130. Let him move up. Let him fight these guys. Um, he's not the most exciting guy either. Let him fight one of these guys where there will be a better chance of the fight being exciting, and it'll be it'll be a matchup of where styles make fights, where his style will come into play. He's got a difficult style, Stevenson. Great talent, great talent. Not a puncher, but but a, a guy who, you know, who can make you miss, even though he got hit, he got touched too much in his last fight, or maybe I'm not giving enough credit to his opponent, but he got touched a lot in that last fight. But he's a guy who depends on defense, depends on control and distance and range, you know, um, looking to outmaneuver you, outcalculate you. Uh, he would be matched up with guys who know how to do that stuff and can punch and have the physical attributes uh, to match him, to match him in, in all physical attribute categories. It would be really, like you said, any of those guys matching up would be interesting. What about in the UFC? Any fights jump out of you there? You got a couple you'd love to see there? I got one that I'd really like to see. The UFC is a couple. First of all, I'd like to see Francis and Ganyu and John Jones. Maybe we're going to see That's it. mine. That's uh, my wish list, too. Yeah. That's the whole list. Because yeah, no, the Ken, UFC, they make every fight you want to see for the most part. For the most part. Yeah, because you know why? It's all in-house. Yep. Truth is the truth. They're not. Yep. You don't have to worry about going across the street to make a fight. You don't have to worry about Aram and and Heyman whether or not they're gonna or 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 Hearn or or De La Hoya. Or, you know, there's only a few power brokers or Warren. There's only that's about it. You don't have to worry about. Um, they're protecting their piece of property. They're not going to make the fight that you want to see because they can't control all facets of the money and everything else. So you're not going to see it because they don't control both sides. But there's one guy that controls all sides, and that's Dana White. So all he cares about is making the fights that are best for the UFC, best for the, the business, best for the product, best for you know, the brand. And, and that's why the brand keeps growing and people get mad at me. Oh, Teddy, you're a boxing guy. How can you say that? That it's, that it's surpassing boxing. It is. It is in certain areas. Where, when you talk about the numbers on pay-per-view, on regular, regular fights week to week, not the, not the, when you put on the, the, when you put on the fight that everyone wants, the epic boxing match, you know, when you put that one on, everyone comes out. But it doesn't get put on, except like when Haley's comment comes along. You know, <laughs> I mean, it, it just doesn't happen enough. So what's happening every week, for the most part, in every week in and every week out, is UFC is putting on the fights you want to see, competitive fights every week. 
instead of just protecting a guy where you know you got a guy you got a, a network that's controlled by a promoter whether it's pbc controlling showtime and fox or or whether it's uh you know espn being controlled by by top rank where for the most part they're just signing up these fighters and they're building their records until they get to a big fight. So you got to go along with it. And they're building their records and they're feeding them, you know, it's like I say, it's like feeding time at the zoo. I mean, they're feeding them raw meat and and you're stuck watching this, uh, you know. And every once in a while you get thrown a bone. But you get thrown a bone every week with the UFC with competitive fights. That's the thing. And there's meat on the bone. There's actually freaking meat on the bone. So this fight, if it happens, you talk about the sweet science, even in MMA and UFC, yeah. You, you got guile and skill versus size and strength. You know, it's been a while since we had David and Goliath. I think it's time for a rematch. I, I really do. And, you know, it's been a couple thousand years. So two questions go into this fight. Can Jones skill, both physically and mentally, defeat or find a way to outmaneuver and beat this behemoth of a man. And number two, what's Jones have left? I mean, the guy is iconic. The guy might be the greatest. I, I think Anderson Silva, for me, is the greatest uh, you know, MMA fighter of all time that I've seen uh, from going back and watching him when he was young, everything. Jones is right up there, right up there. So... Here's a guy who's one of the greatest of all time. Some people think the greatest, and he's still active. What's he got left at his age and at this point in his career after so much inactivity, Ken, and controversy with him outside of the cage? What's he got left? So that's a fight i like to see. I wouldn't mind seeing Shamayev and Covington. I mean, uh, both of these bring explosive talent and confidence, I think that fight could be made. Um, the it factor is there. What's the it factor for me? The it factor is when fighters get in the ring and their mere presence lights it up with, with, with just expectation. With, with just expectation, something special is going to happen. Something explosive is going to happen. We're going to see something that we don't always see, something spectacular. And these guys have that X factor. Um, also, I'd like to see Adesanya, our guy, um, in a rematch with Pereira. I would. You know, he's winning that fight late into the fight, and he gets caught. He gets knocked out. All credit to Pereira, but I'd like to see that. Um, talk about our guy. This might be at the top of my list. I would love to see Volkanovski against Sterling. Now, I know Sterling would have to move up um, to featherweight. And, um, but I would... Uh, Volkanovski is so confident and tough. And Sterling is so, so physically strong and talented. And both of them love to strike. They love to stand and strike. Sterling, I know, is incredible on a mat. I understand that. Volkanovski is also well-rounded. But these guys have those special ingredients in them. They really do. I would, and my man, Sam Rivera, who's also an MMA fighter, he, he, he trains MMA, uh, he goes over to Jersey, he trains over there. A lot of people don't realize our man who films this is really into MMA. He, he knows these guys. I just looked at him when I mentioned Volkanovski and Sterling. He shook his head, yeah, yeah. So for me... Uh, that that's that's getting the approval from the right places. The other one I got to throw it in there. Talk about our man, our real close special man friend, Poirier, and Gagey too. Gagey too. Um, their fight in 2018, Ken, was fight of the year. Their styles almost guarantee that it's got to be the same. Guarantee that it has to be the same. And I'll finish with this one. Conor McGregor and Chandler. Chandler has fought every beast and monster out there ever since 
he came to the UFC from Bellator. He's earned his right to get a huge payday. We already know that his style guarantees nothing but action. We know that McGregor would make it an event. See what he's got left after that bad loss to Poirier and the bad leg break. And I've and just to prove, I don't have to prove it, but just to make sure in the new year that nobody thinks I'm not thinking enough about the women. Without women, we we <laughs> wouldn't be we wouldn't be here. We wouldn't be here. It's that simple. But a woman's fight. Shevchenko versus Wiley. I would love to see that. Uh, again, their striking skills guaranteed to be entertaining, plus the skill and confidence level of both. Wiley, you know, both of them. Uh, Wiley is well-rounded, um, you know, in all areas. Uh, they both are, um, uh, it, it would be... It would be tremendous. I think it would be really exciting to watch. Um, intriguing fight. Anyway, I'm out of the candy store. I'm out. I'm out of the candy <laughs> store. I'm. I'm. I'm having a. I'm having a. A little bit of a sugar meltdown. But come at me, Ken. Come at me. Ken. <laughs> that's pretty thorough. I mean, that's a pretty good breakdown of the year that was and a good look ahead at what we hope to see and what we're expecting to see. So as in Ganyu, as in Ganyu and Jones, the only one you want to see at UFC. I mean, it's there. Oh, no, no, no. You 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 covered them all there. I mean, yeah. <laughs> any of those I mean, who, who would be imagine. your next choice? Who would be your next choice? I hadn't even thought about Shemaev and um yeah. and um, Covington, but oh man, the hype for that fight would be unbelievable. Talk about two trash talkers. That would be a fun one. The buildup would be great. And of course, I love seeing Dustin Poirier fight anyone, so that would be a good one as well. See him in there with Gaethje again. I just, that's such a dangerous fight. It's hard to like root for your friend to get in there and uh, put himself in a dangerous situation. But yeah, that would be an incredible fight as well. Yeah, it would be. Really one other one I'd like to see in box, and I'd love to see Regis Progre if um, if Josh Taylor gets past Catterall. I'd love to see Regis just selfishly get another shot at Josh Taylor, maybe in the U.S. Yeah, you know, he might wind up getting Teofimo Lopez before he gets Josh Taylor. <laughs> well, according to, according to uh, Teo's dad, uh, they've already won that fight. Oh, well, I mean... <laughs> I love the trash talk back and forth of Tiafimo's dad talking about, we're going to do this, we're going to do that. And Regis said to him, we, question mark, you ain't getting in the ring. Your son's going to have to get in there, basically, like, zip it. Let the fighters do the talking. Yeah, well, I mean, his his father is, well, it's his, well, I think we've traveled down that road in the past. <laughs> um, you know, in, the, in 2022, we traveled down that road. Unfortunately, that road seems like it will continue uh, in that direction uh, in 2023, where the father will say things that, you know, if you try to figure it out. Uh, Customato, you know what he used to say to me, Ken? He used to say, listen, Teddy, don't try to figure out some of the things some of these people say, because if you do, you're going to make yourself as crazy as they are. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, That's a good point. You know, and uh, it's, it's you know, sometimes you just got to say, yeah, all right. Yep. Okay. That's it. Well, Teddy, that was a good one. I appreciate all the uh, insight and thoughts. I'm sure the fans are going to love this one. Thank you to all the fans for being with us another year. Looking forward to a, pros a prosperous 2023. You got anything else, Teddy, before we say goodbye? No, just like we started at the, at the top. You know, let's just be better. I want to be better. I want to be better in 2023 than I was. In every way. I want to be better on the podcast. I want to be a better friend. I want to be a better father, a better husband, a better grandfather, a better brother, uh, you know, a better person. Uh, and that's all. That, that we should all strive, you know. We should all strive. It starts at home. You know, it starts at home. And it starts with yourself. And yep. I, I know that I, I would like to be better. And I would hope that we can all be better. That we can yeah. all be better. 
uh, as a country, as a people, uh, you know, anyway. I'm with you. Uh, no, I agree. And with that, guys, Happy New Year. Thanks for being with us again. Look forward to seeing you guys in the new year. Lots of big things in the works. Thanks for being with us. Thanks, Teddy.